Hi folks, welcome to Sunday's edition of the I Write Radio podcast video cast. Having had a day off, we're incredibly refreshed. Um, we're going to have a chat about Mar and the Brewer Politics Scotland show. Um, basically, well, basically because it points out what's wrong with our BBC at the moment. Um, and we're also going to touch on Australia. Stuart's got a son there, and he's quite impressed with what they're doing. So the Mars show, Jimmy, you, you caught that. Aye, um, I thought it was a, it was a bit of a bland show this morning um, till the bold Ed Miliband appeared and Andrew Marr asked him bits and bobs about coronavirus and how he thought everything was going, then decided to spend, I don't know, was it five, six, seven minutes babbling on about anti-Semitism and the Labour Party and the recent sack in the Rebecca Long Bailey. And I know that's easy territory for the BBC because they've all had the crib sheet sent out to them. But I found it rather boring, if I'm honest, and quite insulting, I thought. Well, I, I actually timed it, and it was seven minutes on the Rebecca Long Bailey incident. Um, it, it, I mean, when you consider what's going on, that wasn't talked about, you know, the the fact that there's still got huge numbers of coronavirus infections in England, the fact that um, half the cabinet's been accused of dodgy dealing, all these things were vaguely touched on. That that deserved the seven minutes or more. Um, this present one about the mil, uh, billion pound uh, building scheme right. in London mm. deserved a lot more attention than the fact that Rebecca Long Bailey isn't an anti Semite, but because she mentioned the word Israel, she had to lose her job. Yeah, it, I. I, I... I agree with you, mate. I thought it was a bit of a nonsense. And as I say, I thought it was shoddy, lazy journalism for Andrew Marr because it's easy. It's something that they've spent weeks and weeks talking about prior to the election so he can just bring out all the old nasty tropes about Labour being anti-Semitic because they're opposed to the State of Israel. And I thought it was poor. I, I didn't think he handled it very well, if I'm honest, but there we go. I thought his last question to him was... Uh... To Miliband was was interesting. He basically he apologised for the question before he asked it. I'm going to ask you a nasty question now, Ed. Um, is uh, Keir Starmer a better leader of the Labour Party than you were? I'd give Ed Mal, uh, Miliband his due. He didn't even hesitate. Yes, he is. And then proceeded to list all his all his good points, which I yeah, thought that was a... quite quite a nice juxtaposition to never, if, imagine <laughs> Boris being asked that question. Yeah. We never ha did actually find out why Ed jumped in to deny his much more talented brother the chance of being the leader of the opposition. Because You'll his much more talented that, brothers are brother. thatcher right. Mm -hmm. And it's quite, basically, basically it was family politics were put ahead of party politics were put ahead of the nation because Ed doesn't like his big brother that much and didn't he want his big brother to be leader of the Labour Party. Ed's, Ed was left of, of his brother. That's effectively what it was. Not very far. Well, not when you look at Corbyn, but when you looked at them together, he looked right. much more like a socialist than his brother ever has. Bet his brother can juggle sandwiches, not just eat them. Aye, well, I, I do think the 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 visuals Actually, on it didn't look good. While I'm on that point, and I do apologise if anybody finds this offensive, nobody ever asked him the question. As a Jew, what are you doing eating a bacon sandwich, Ed? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, trying to be all all things to all men, possibly. Maybe maybe that's what it was. I that maybe just likes bacon. Again, I'm a sucker for a bacon piece, mate. Aye, who is they? Who isn't it? I hate America. They don't do proper break and rolls. Stuart, did you catch any of Mar? Did you uh, did you get a bit oh, of pretty yeah. Patel? Pretty Patel. He flagged <laughs> her up and I moaned. I, I missed the first half of Mar. 
life was too interesting without putting the TV on. However, I caught the, the most of uh, the Pretty Patel <coughs> interview. Um, I'm trying to find polite words. Brown nosing, it's called. Mm. It's, doesn't, it's not as though he needs anything from Pretty Patel. Um, I have no idea. He seemed to give her the easiest, <laughs> the easiest I... interview I have ever heard him give. You certainly didn't put any pressure on our answers. Nothing at all. I was shouting at the TV set at the end. I switched it off. I didn't catch the last two minutes. I didn't I think, blame you. I think Nori put it right earlier before we came on air when he just said that you could tell she was getting easy because she never once got nasty. Because that's the indicator with Pretty Patel. I mean, if somebody asks her a question she doesn't like, she turns and is venomous. I mean, that, that's the way she operates. And I don't know whether Mar is scared of that reaction from an interviewee or what, but she never once got annoyed. You never got that icy stare from her, which to me basically mm -hmm. says it was a waste of time doing the interview. All she seemed to exactly. do was, and I mean, I suppose that's her job as Home Secretary, but the only thing I came away with was you hypocritical swear word. Um, we support the police. They can have all the resources they want. We want them to stamp out everything that they want to yeah. stamp out. Look, that, it started that was right. The, message. The, the, the opening was a straightforward question from Andrew Marr, and she launched straight into a speech that she'd rehearsed, which wasn't nothing to do with the question that, that, that he'd asked, and yet he never pulled her about it. And from then yeah. on, I just started throwing socks and things at the telly. That's just. That's clearly her, Nadim Zahawi, and the Chancellor were the top three uh, performers at Dominic Cummings School for how to handle interviews. Because that's what they do. They just launch into a speech that they've practiced beforehand. And they get away with it time after time because the BBC, they are, they are feared for their future. So they're they're no scared. To they're scared to get boycotted. I think that's right. actually worked for Cummings. I think they're actually scared that they have to turn up every Sunday and say, oh, there wasn't a government minister available well, on Newsnight. Not, not being fired has worked to the best thing, it has been turned out to be the best thing in the world for Cummings. He can basically now bully whoever he wants and he's not going to get binned by Boris because he, he should have been out the door. I mean... He, his air should have been on fire as he flew down Downing Street. He is, he he's quite well, he's, he's untouchable. He's untouchable. He's untouchable. No, he's untouchable. He's very, 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 very dangerous. I can't think of enough varies because he's now sacked the head of the civil service. The or is about to. Mark Sidwell has got his, he's got his jotters and he's out this week. Now, well, how much power is saying. that? I, what I find sort of the really interesting thing about it is if you think of the length of time that any scandal lasted with a Labour member of Parliament compared to the length of time, well, a Labour SPAD or member of Parliament, compared to the length of time that Cummings has been on the front pages. Aye, they'd have all been gone. Everybody in the past would have been gone for half of what he's done, mate. Well, but I'm, I'm really even just important. talking about the pressure that our press put, put, have put him under. It's, it's just so not commiserate. It, our no, press I, is a swear word embarrassment now. It's also costing m masses of public money, mate. I mean, this nonsense, ARPA, and the budget he's been given to look after, that's his wee sideline. He's already tanned a couple of hundred million. Who's this? Buying Cummings. He's already oh. tanned a couple of hundred million buying a share of a satellite company. So that <laughs> the UK, Bankrupt the, no, satellite company. Right, so that the UK can have its own um, GPS system. The problem is the satellites are in the wrong orbit. He's tanned 200 million on a system that when he worked, and he's not held to account by anyone. It's, not that's another... That, that was... That another Brexiteer lie because they claimed that we would remain part of Galileo 
which is right. the GPS system that... Just, just as a quick one, Nori, while I'm, while I'm on my high horse, did you see all that furore in the bloody Unionist press? Because Nicola Sturgeon paid a tenner for a tartan mask that she wore when she went to the shops on Friday. Now, the tenner came out of her pocket. Two pound of that, it turns out, goes to shelter because it's a homeless tartan. The Unionists were up in arms saying how petty it was for her to wear tartan. Boris has just spunk 900 million paint in the back of the arse of a plane. And they're wanting about a tenner for a face mask. Oh, hold on, hold on, Jimmy. The best photograph existing of uh, <coughs> Johnson is him and Union Jack shorts or something, isn't it? With two flags? Oh. <coughs> aye, aye. Well, two flags was morning. when he got caught in the zip wire. It beats that photo this morning where he was trying to look like a, a somebody to park What's that, guy? Is it Paul Sinclair, Labour guy? Aye, aye, that? He was absolutely doing his dinger about a face mask. You're like, really, mate? Aye, Labour guy that also, <laughs> come on, mate. He worked for Joanne Lamon, then he worked for Ruth Davidson. The boy's got worse taste than women and me, and that's gone some. <laughs> oh, I hope none of your exes are watching this, Jimmy. You'll get your airs in your hands. <laughs> I can still run fast when I need to, mate. Okay, let's move on to Brewer. Brewer did not have a good day. Yeah. Um, he opened up his uh, his attack. Now, what was it? What was the the very first question he answered? It only lasted about a minute. God, I've forgotten. Oh, was that him, Andrew Kerr? No, but but basically, he, 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 to start with, apart perhaps the first minute, he had Glenn Campbell, the senior BBC political reporter, on because he'd been. Who had he been speaking to? But it, it was it, it was pitched as an SNP bad story, and it didn't work. I can't remember what it uh, was. They were on to God. Who was he talking to? It wasn't Glasgow, was it? That's outrageous. Three years and years can remember it. <laughs> who was Glenn Campbell tells, talking to? Tells you how shite the program was, all right, you know. But, oh, um, was was that not the Keir Starmer thing? Ah, it was on the Keir Starmer. That's that right. wasn't the first question. No, no, I didn't say it was. But the first question was something that was pitched as SNP bad and didn't develop that way. So it literally, I think it was Glasgow. And he basically skimmed right across it. Because I remember but, uh, thinking every other paper in the country is going to have this on its front page. And the best, Brewer doesn't want to talk about it because it was dealt with well. The best part of uh, the start of the Brewer show was the fact that not, not one of the three of us could actually remember what it was about yeah, until we were yeah, forced yeah. to. It was so bad, it was forgettable. Right. Well, his, his attempts at SMB bad ran through the programme. I mean, the, the sad attempt to try and somehow insinuate that the SMP shouldn't have taken um, more fiscal control and more devolved powers because now we're in a situation where we might not have enough money to cover their COVID costs. Ridiculous. And I noticed the one part that he glossed over in that situation was these, that fiscal powers that we have are renegotiated next year because it's a transitional fiscal arrangement that we're in at the moment. Well, that, she, but, she did, what was her name, Carson, is it? Is uh, oh, I wrote that down, mate. I, um, she did... Caroline, Gardner, the outgoing auditor of general. Gardner. Well, she That's did. She did very well. I wouldn't say she tipped to the SNP side because she did have criticisms. No. But I find what she said made sense and was pretty balanced, which Brewer wasn't too happy about. By his, because he, he was Look. desperately, he was desperately trying to put words in her mouth. But at the end of the day, she's not a politician. She's actually an expert at what she does, and she just would not have. A political hack chucking any words in her mouth. No, I wasn't having it, but it, it was before she even got to answer anything. He was going on. He couldn't think of how. I, I felt like shouting at him, why don't you do some prep, Gordon? Write down what you mean to ask instead of rambling around for five minutes before you ask your stupid question. <laughs> it wasn't even clever. I mean, Jimmy Sugar. suggested earlier on it was, a, it was a trap. It wasn't even clever enough to be a trap. 
I yeah, think, but I think we should have done some prep on me if we can't remember what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I found, what I found interesting about that is I can remember when the fiscal framework was being put together for uh, the devolved settlement. Um, well, after two, 2014. And I can remember Brewer doing the, are you going to be cowards and not accept this? You've been banging on about wanting more powers. You should be grabbing this with both hands. And now he's finally remembered that there was a, it was a trap. We all knew it was a trap. We all said it was a trap, but as, the, as, as an SNP government, it's impossible yeah. to see to to more powers. The reality is the fact that it's to be renegotiated next year means they knew it was a trap and they thought they could cope with four years of a trap and have a renegotiation. Oh, they don't even want to go there. Look, um, it was interesting as well. Um, <laughs> Brewer with this woman. We discovered earlier on this morning, now you see I'm having a struggle here, but we discovered early on this morning, and maybe it was on Sky, that Scotland had uh, done there's an argument they are not doing enough testing. And yet, of all the testing that they did this week, they found 0.3% of positive tests. In other words, they tested nearly 5,000 or something, and, it, and they, only, they hardly find any uh, COVID cases in Scotland. It's not worthwhile ramping it up to 15,000. You're just going to find another nine positive cases. And yet, there was Gordon Brewer going on doing an SMP. We've lost you, Stuart. Bad, but they say testing. We're still only doing a fraction ah, did, of the he testing. He went on as well about um, Why? problems with PPE, the problems with PPE that basically didn't exist. The problems, certainly in the NHS, there were problems at the very start with PPE, but they were sorted out relatively quickly. And frankly, PPE is a bit of a success story in Scotland, given how many manufacturers stepped up to the plate and actually started producing stuff that we needed so that we now have an, an, an in-country supply chain. Well, the, the problem with, with PPE, PPE in Scotland, as you said earlier, Jimmy, was care homes, who care had homes. not done their job properly and prepared properly. Therefore, the Scottish government had to step in and give them gear. Mm -hmm. So, But I still think we can, we're, we can wind up on Brewer by saying it's bad performance by both Brewer and Marr this morning. They were both absolute rubbish. Well, I, I mean, I, I have to say that as an SNP supporter, I think the SNP came out very well because, you know, your experts are pretty guarded about committing to saying, yeah, good job. And yet two of them said that today. You yeah, know? I mean, David, David Schrader, I think, has... Um, she's kind of... We've, we've all kind of noticed just how she's come on through this whole thing. She's an expert. She's also very, very good at getting her point across. Um, well, she I did have that, a criticism. Mm -hmm. I, I, her criticism brilliant. was yeah. testing. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't mind. I didn't mind. I didn't mind a bit of criticism coming for somebody who's now universally seen as a pretty decent expert. Um, and I think that the last, when she mentions things like the last two months figures, you're kind of getting the hint from her that the last two months, that's where the real divergence came about. You know, so, uh, through February, March, and most of April, we were kind of operating that um, four-country yeah. policy. It's the middle of April onwards that really the divergence came about. And it's noticeable that the other three countries that make up the United Kingdom have all diverged from England and have all got similar results to our own. Well, that was, that was one of the points you made, wasn't it? Because you basically said England is now the outlier. Everybody mm. else is, is not looking for suppression. They're looking for eradication, yeah, um, looking which, which was interesting. On, on testing, it struck me today that this testing all care home workers and all frontline NHS staff, it's, it's got, it smacks of PR to me. And, That's a bit, doesn't it? And that might be a wrong step at this point. Having been so upfront about things, I mean, her Nicholas Sturgeon's big thing was always um, testing negative is no good 
because you could catch the virus the minute you walk out the door. You're only negative at that point. I mean, she really did emphasize that up till about 10 days ago. And I wonder if this is the first misstep where I she's, I think she's decided that, to to agree to do, you know, all staff in care homes, NHS staff, frontline staff, anyway. Yeah, but I think I think they'll be able to if if they get to the point where they can say right, we've had a hundred percent of NHS and care home staff tested, and that hundred percent will be tested again weekly. Um, if we get to the point where you do that for a couple of weeks and the numbers are still going down, you just draw a line under that and say, by the way. It's not worth continuing with that testing at this moment in time because, I mean, I was, I was surprised just how few people died in Scotland in the last week. I was surprised just because of the mm. number that low that quickly. I'm also surprised that a city like Leicester has had almost twice as many new infections last week as the country of Scotland has. Well, the average daily new infections in Scotland was only 17 a day. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think as I say, the testing one, ah, you might be right, or it might have been a misstep to agree to that, but now that, they've set the, now that they've set themselves that bar and they're pretty close to clearing it, I think it'll be something else that they can put a tick against and it, draw a line under relatively quickly. Do, you fancy, do, do either you guys fancy having this test done where they take a swab yeah. and they put it up your nose and right down the back of your nose and then they scrape the back of your throat and take it out again and put it in a plastic bag? How do you fancy that? I don't fancy I don't, it. but have you seen the size of my nose, mate? They could date with a javelin without any issues. That's <laughs> spread over half my coupon, and it's a big coupon. Uh, I, don't, I don't fancy it at all, actually. No, it's, it, 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 it looks nasty when you see unpleasant. it getting done. It. Yeah, um, but small, small price to pay if it well, has to be done. Well, it depends where you are. I think some places they've got saliva tests. Uh, I, I, I just keep following the, a different things to do with the coronavirus, uh, this, you know, this pandemic in various different countries all over the world. And it's the phenomenal variety of innovative ideas going on. And yet the discussion, the, the narrative in this country with the media is so narrow, narrow narrative. God, sorry, come up with that. Ciao, it, it is not discussing all the possibilities that could be going on in this country, which are going on all over the world. I'm sorry, are you talking about testing specifically? Or? No, broadly, all kinds of uh, initiatives could be taken, not just testing. But there's, that, there's still testing all over the world in different, in, in different ways, in different quantities. A million people in the Paris region were to be tested in five days this week. I can, I can actually see... In the near future, a good case for testing up the community testing, uh, ramping up the community testing. I mean, I, I don't know what the figures are. I don't know if it's a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. You know, for that they would normally test during flu, uh, the flu season and stuff like that. But I could see a case for them to get as a, a, a really accurate picture of what's happening across the whole of the country. Um, I think it would be a good idea to, well, to look, plan for I'll that. Give you, I'll give you a, a, a genuine comparison. The state of Victoria in Australia has got a population of roughly 5 million, about the size of Scotland. And they were planning to do 100,000 tests over five days to nip this current outbreak in the bud. Can you imagine that happening in Scotland? Yeah. No. Yeah, no, I'm I sorry, I could. All you have to do be. is persuade people to go to where they need tested. We've got the capacity to do it. And I, I think that's one of the problems. I think that as, as the threat of the coronavirus recedes, people become less willing to get in the car and drive out to an airport to get well, tested. Well, they're going the doors. They're chapping on the doors to do that in, uh, in Australia. Door knocking. They're doing it at people's doors. I think that'd be a. I think to do community testing on that level here would be a complete waste of resources. Could we be right. We don't have any need to be doing that now. Now, as I say, the, the the number of people contracting in the community is tiny. So why would you want to start chapping doors and worrying people and doing a, an invasive test like that? 
as as long as the test and trace has the capability i mean it seems a lot it seems an awful waste of energy knocking on doors when what you should be doing is pinpointing the source of infection and then chasing down think, the spread i think the, the what we have now in terms of test and trace appears to be outstanding but it's doing it on a very limited basis because the transmission so low in scotland now yeah um I how long, think we how have long to, will that last? Yeah, exactly. We're, we're all kind of worried about July the 15th and seeing this mass invasion of people from our virus-ridden neighbour jumping in their car and firing up here. Um, I think, I so, counterintuitively, I think a wee spike, a wee local spike um, that proves to the public that test and trace works would be beneficial. At the moment. I think we're almost certain to see one, given that every country that's that seems to have done pretty well with this has seen spikes. I mean, even New Zealand, have got about 20 cases at the moment. Um, aye, aye. So if, if, if something like, let's, <laughs> heaven, heaven forfend, but if something happened like a Nike conference where you had 27 infections or whatever, it'd be good to actually see that the track and trace does work. I think from the point of view of the public's trust in the system, um, it would be useful, I think, especially with them looking at what's going to happen when schools open again. Um, it's worth remembering just what we're talking about spike. We've got to make a difference between spike and a, a second wave. Second wave, they're not expecting a second wave until the autumn or winter in, this, in the UK. So there could be a spike next week. Yeah, um, and all the experts are pointing out that difference at the moment, aren't they? But it's more likely to be at the end of July, just before the, our kids go back to school. Well, we've got, we've kind of got time, you know, we've got the whole of July. Well, we've got six weeks, more or less, haven't we? Mm. Um, so hopefully Aye, anything that catches us out can be dealt with in that six weeks. Yeah, exactly. As I see, I think... Test and trace is probably underused now, the system that we've got, but it's cracking that it's there. Um, the thing with schools opening up, I would hope that there's no mass rush from England to fire up here when their schools go on holiday in the middle of July, but do you we'll think, just have to wait and see with that. Do you think there's any chance that the Scottish government will introduce a quarantine rule for people coming over the border. I can't see them being allowed to close the border. No, but no. I think I think the, the quarantine, the threat of quarantine is a good one. I think I think it's certainly worth them investigating that because it might stop 50, 60 percent of the influx of people that would want to come here. Which anything that cuts it down isn't a bad thing in my opinion because it, looking at what they've done to the south coast of England. You don't want mass, masses of people piling up here. Um, I know people that live in Highland communities that have had zero positive cases. I mean, these communities, they rely on tourists, but it's a double-edged thing with them. They've had zero cases. They're kind of a wee bit reticent to well, block fortnight, that copybook by inviting tourists up here. A fortnight should be long enough to see what the outcome of the English experiment is. One would hope... Uh, sorry, right, let's move on. Jimmy, you had something else you wanted to bring up. You've forgotten, haven't you? Uh, kind of have, me. Aye, it's one of them days. <laughs> well, we were <laughs> going to talk about the coverage of Glasgow, weren't we? We were going to talk about the coverage of the Glasgow attacks and how um, ah, yeah, yeah. our esteemed BBC ran for about an hour, an hour and a half, telling people that three people had been killed. When in fact nobody was killed apart from the perpetrator who was shot dead by the police. But um, it was strange coverage to say the least because, well, like I say, they were telling you there had been fatalities that weren't there. I but, think it's because there were the fatal three fatalities that it, the coverage got really ramped up. So the BBC and, and Sky News both went live, bye bang, straight oh. away. So sorry. Because they thought there were three futa uh, three fatalities. Yeah, so there were three they fatalities. Were, the, 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 the early news was six stabbings, three of them dead. Aye. Well, it wasn't news. 
these are supposed to be facts. The early rumor was. <laughs> that, that's the story that Jimmy. Aye, they went on the rumor, eh? Aye, and John Beatty actually tweeted that it was confirmed. And somebody asked him for his source for the confirmation. John Beaton. John, John Beaton might have gave them a source to because he's, he's far, far better as an ex-bloody rugby player than he ever has been as a journalist. But um, I didn't realise he'd said, he'd actually confirmed that three people had he died. He tweeted it was what confirmed. A, what an embarrassment for the BBC. Uh, he's a big uh, laddie, John Beaton. Wouldn't he argue, I, I, man? I, I, That's all right, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I think I once broke his brother's nose. Charles, Charles. Yeah, I used to work beside John Beatty. Plant sevens. He used to share the coffee making. Um, aye, it was not a great day for that, but it was interesting. It's part of that frenzy when something happens in Scotland that looks like it'll make us look as, I was going to say as badass, but let's just say the same as England. You know, they must have been champing at the bit to get a terrorist incident up here. Aye, aye. And hopefully uh, there was no baggage handlers to beat the crap out of whoever was perpetrating it. Well, I did. it struck me even with even that. Perhaps, it, perhaps it's sounding a bit callous, but, it, uh, you know, you could say the story is similar to the baggage handler at Glasgow Airport. Then you can hear. Aye. Well, it was a bit, dis it was a bit disappointing that um, Kermit the Nazi decided to be tweeting about it before he knew anything whatsoever and basically trying to blame asylum seekers and in fact well, he, he called he went, asylum he seekers and he called them illegal immigrants yeah right. yeah and it was, it was nothing to do with any illegal immigrants he also the part, another part of his tweet was saying that hotels around the country are being filled with boatloads of these people abject nonsense they are not that was the question i couldn't remember from brewer the question was about asylum seekers being in hotels and stuff, and how bad was that? And when well, he realised that it was actually a UK government policy mm -hmm. to employ the company that moved them out of flats and into hotels, and it was pointed out to him that there'd been demonstrations the week before in Glasgow about the problems that was causing, uh, that Scottish ministers had contacted British ministers, because they weren't happy mm -hmm. about the situation, what should have been an SNP bad story turned into a UK quickly, government bad story. Quickly turns into a Whitehall privatisation has made a James Hunt of this story. Aye. Yeah. Because it has. I mean, the Mears group that are running this thing, Glasgow City Council, Edinburgh City Council, the Scottish Government, they've all been on to them saying, can you please do something about this? And they just get ignored because Mears... They have no answer to anybody other than the Home Office. And Pretty Patel's not going to give them a hard time because she's probably got a husband that's a shareholder or something. <laughs> and if well, she hasn't, there'll be a Tory MP that has. Aye, well, that seems to be how things operate in London these days, mate. I mean, why really? on earth? Why on earth are some of the most vulnerable people on the planet being safeguarded by nameless, faceless private organisations is it really just so that the government can wash their hands of the treatment that these people get? Is it as it's so as responsibility it, can it, be passed down the line. It is interesting that having followed the, uh, that incident live, it was interesting to try and figure out if there was uh, a bad angle, to, uh, a non-mentally unstable angle, in other words, a t terrorist angle. Was it going to be a case of some right-wing nutter got into the hotel and stabbed six uh, innocent asylum seekers, or was it one inside that had lost the plot? And uh, I will. The, the white staff. I mean, the whole thing was up, up for grabs. And that's that's why it was nice to see the first minister, as soon as she possibly could, get out there on BBC, Channel Four, and Sky, and that, and say, "Look, please stop." tweeting whatever conspiracy theory you've come up with for putting two and two together and reaching 13 or 14 mm. let things unfold let us sort this out there's no danger to the public and let us find out what's happened here because 
I wasn't paying a lot of attention, if I'm honest. I took a look at a couple of things on Twitter and thought, Ken, what? This is all just conjecture. I'm not wanting any to do it. Because you can what Twitter's like. You'll just end up replying to somebody and calling them a ball bag, and it just escalates for there. We don't all behave like that every day, you know, Jimmy. I've got yeah, an interesting yeah. question that comes out of this, guys, that hasn't really been talked about. Is there armed police on the streets of Glasgow now? There's armed yeah. police everywhere, mate. Aye, there's, there's, there's armed... There's ARUs running about Edinburgh right now. Yeah, absolutely. ARUs? Armed response units. units. There's always armed response units running about me. I don't have a problem with armed response units, you know, guns in vehicles to be taken out if and when necessary. But the reaction time seemed very quick to get an armed policeman there. I don't see why it was quick. It was only two minutes from George Square. Where would you hang Aye. about in, in an armed response vehicle? Well, that's that's kind of center, mate, problem with armed response, isn't it? You could be 20 miles away or right next door. Aye. But, but it seemed very Scot quick. In Scotland, mate, you'll find that the ARUs are pretty much city centres. Um, let's be honest. <laughs> Holyrood, there's about four of them in there, mate. They're, as well as the guys that guard Holyrood, there's about four ARUs coming to there. Um, Glasgow, aye, they're going to be around George Square, mate. So I'm not surprised it was only two or three minutes. But I it seemed, they... um, I suppose, uh, possibly we were lucky because it was close or whatever. Uh, don't forget, it was also, I mean, not, the other day I drove out to visit my brother in Fife, and instead of taking three quarters of an hour to get out of the bridge, it only took me 20 minutes. So <laughs> I didn't see Glasgow will be much the same. It's pretty quiet, the city streets, even now. Yeah, yeah. No, it was just something that I was surprised um, hasn't yet appeared in our unionist press. Nicholas Sturgeon, arms are bobbies on the beat. Uh, well, they, they, they kind of tone at that point, mate, because the, a lot of the union press are um, desperate to have me armed coppers floating a bit. It seems to I'm be proportionate. Thank God they didn't shoot anybody, they didn't have to, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But there you well, go. Well, I, I figured out a long time ago, you can tell which police car has got an armed response vehicle. Just take a look at the extra equipment on it. Do you think they're going to put all that extra equipment on just an ordinary panda car? No, no. There's no such so, thing as an ordinary panda car these days, mate. Right, well, you get a big boot. So do well, MI5 cars have extra equipment? Because I presume they're armed. I would imagine they wouldn't. They, they would be man marked, though, wouldn't they? The old Jensen interceptors, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Hold it. When did we slide back into 1965? Sorry, I, I watched a James Bond movie last night, actually, and he stole nice, the car. Eh? Stole mm. his car from him, and half of it did be work. See, you can t you can tell what how how old folk are by the things that are related to me. I was going to say earlier, I was disappointed that neither the police and a Starsky and Hutch butt slide over the bonnet of the motor to get to the hotel faster. Well, do you know what was the best thing about it was his dashboard with all his switches for his machine guns and ejector seats and everything. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that machine you used to get that would press, it was like a plastic strip and it would press a letter into it. And yes. you stuck it on files and things. I can't remember mm -hmm. what it was called. Dymo machines. Dymo machines. That was what was um, used to tell you what the switch did, which I thought was a nice touch. That was a very sort of 60s, 70s touch. Mm -hmm. Aye, quality. Good. What on earth was that in the background? Was that Stuart's phone? That was, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't normally get interruptions. <laughs> it just, well, Stuart. It just, it sounded I, a wee bit reggae, mate. I was going to have a wee boogie. Uh, <laughs> you got anything you'd, you'd like to finish with? I think, I, I thought you would have had that look at um, video clip of the Half naked man bopping around at the bottom of uh, Lothian Road and uh, Princess Street the other day, Never running saw over it. the roofs of cars. Aye, that was. Uh, that was about, he Dawson? Was it? No, it wasn't. No, don't go. Don't fit go for Dawson. Dawson. No, he was a bit too fit for Dawson. What was Aye, well, just, uh, Dawson was Dawson was doing worse on the very same day. At least that boy still had his pants on. Dawson didn't he when he was dancing around Berners Street? Apparently. Oh well. Jimmy, anything Did to you? finish with? Eh, uh, not really, mate, no. no. Well, I've got a clip of the First Minister uh, giving the guy from the Express, I think it was, a bit of a kick-in yesterday that I think we should play out with. 
Okay, no. um, so I'll say thanks for listening, folks. And thanks for being with us, Stuart Lockhead and Jimmy Bye-bye. Hunt. I'm Norrie Stewart. And we'll play you out with the First Minister giving one of her press questioners, Laldi, the other day. Yesterday, uh, Friday, in fact. Friday. Oh, taking the time to load, boys. Don't know what's going on here. Well, I know the Daily Mail often thinks I should just follow uh, the UK government. Um, but interestingly, I, I don't think I should blindly follow anybody. I think I should make the decisions that I think are right for Scotland. That's my job and my duty. Uh, but, you know, retail opened in England before uh, the decision taken this week by the UK government to give flexibility, not abandon the two metre, because that's not what they've done in England, but give more flexibility. Um, I've got to take these decisions on the basis of the best advice and the best evidence. Uh, moving away from two metres is not consequential free, it's not risk free, it increases the risk. So I've got to go through with my advisors and, and the rest of the government a process of assuring ourselves that we understand that risk and we can mitigate it. Um, I understand, I, I understand and I hear loudly and clearly the economic arguments for uh, more flexibility around two metres and I, I hope we can get there. But I've got to do that carefully so that we're not putting lives at risk because lives really matter too. And if this virus starts to go out of control again, that doesn't help the economy. So I, I will continue to take these decisions in a, a careful and cautious way. And you know, I heard somebody say yesterday, somebody in the media, I can't remember who it was, and I wouldn't name them even if I could, say Scotland's lagging behind the rest of the UK in opening up the economy. Well, that's not strictly true. We're perhaps a couple of weeks behind England. But flip that the other way round right now. England is lagging behind Scotland in the suppression of this virus. Our case numbers are falling faster. I think we'll leave it at that, lads, eh? Uh, so she's actually, I think that's the first time I've actually heard her say Scotland's doing better than England. Yeah. And on that note, I think we'll call it a day, folks. Thanks for listening. Uh,